Uh, I'm Cynthia Mills, and I would like to welcome you to the symposium, American Art in a Global Context, which has been organized by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Let me begin by relaying the warm regards of our director, Elizabeth Brune, who would hope to be with us this afternoon. As it turns out, Dr. Brune is not thinking in an international context today, but rather a personal one. She is in Atlanta celebrating the birth of her first grandchild. <laughs> for those of us here today, for many former fellows, longtime colleagues, and friends of the museum, this event is in part a reunion and a homecoming. We hope out-of-towners have had an opportunity to begin exploring our renovated building, now called the Reynolds Center for American Art and Portraiture, which is shared with the National Portrait Gallery and the Archives of American Art. All of us welcome you home. The generous response to our call for paper proposals for this symposium and the overwhelming registration to attend present evidence of genuine interest at this time in the study of art of the United States in an international context. Our call for papers elicited some 90 proposals, many of them excellent, on diverse subjects ranging from Norwegian pop art to new aspects of Anglo-American history painting and studies of a variety of immigrant identities. Our beautiful new auditorium could not hold all of the people who sought to register, and I hope many of the scores we could not accommodate will see the talks via the Smithsonian webcast. Over the past months, our symposium website also has recorded a significant number of visits. All of these developments are yet another demonstration of the global turn in American art. Clearly, this is not a brand new area of study. We have long investigated influences on American art. And for some time, we have begun looking anew at the connectedness between American art and artists and the rest of the world with an especially healthy beginning seen in 18th century studies. American studies scholarship certainly has moved in advance of art history in many ways. But these days, we do appear to be extending our reach and considering more subtle, complex approaches and geographically diverse perspectives and interrelationships. And of course, contemporary artists also lead us in this respect, crossing borders regularly, perhaps living in New York and Munich, or Tokyo, Paris, and Santa Fe, and exhibiting their work at a, at a shifting array of international fairs. We could not attempt to be comprehensive in the talks that will be presented over the next three days. They represent just a few ideas about the many issues that could be discussed, but I think all show that this global turn, this widening of interests and viewpoints, is adding richness and vitality to our field. It will be interesting to witness the durability and the changing meanings of these international threads amid our increasingly fragile relations with other nations and peoples in the post 9-11 world. We expect to leave this symposium with some new colleagues and new excitement about directions we can take, but also with some nuts and bolts strategies about how we can attract to our field more foreign scholars who currently lack primary materials, opportunities for direct encounter with American art, and institutional support to devote their full-time attention to U.S. art. A real impact has already been made by the Terra Foundation for American Art, which has been the primary supporter for this symposium, as well as for many other conferences, important exhibitions, and study opportunities in the U.S., Europe, and soon Asia. The foundation has, in addition, been a major funder for an important digitization project by the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art which will make primary materials more accessible around the globe. And it is funding several Terra fellowships each year at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. The foundation's interests clearly helped to steer us to this symposium theme. And thus for this, as well as its financial support, we are indeed grateful. We also received support for related symposium events this weekend from the Smithsonian Latino Center the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Program, and the Goethe Institute of Washington. On the museum staff, we have all been impressed with the masterful organization of our symposium manager, Amelia Gerlitz, who has ably juggled the myriad details of putting together such an ambitious event. And you'll see much of her 
uh, in the next days, as well as our more than 20 staff members, interns, docents, and fellows who are pitching in to help. A few logistical details. Please turn off your cell phones. Um, I'm sorry, but no food or drink is allowed in the auditorium, including bottled water, unless you're a speaker. <laughs> um, and don't forget that after tonight's keynote address, there will be a book signing uh, <laughs> with our keynote speaker, Adam Gopnik, up in the G Street lobby. Um, and um, finally, we're counting on, uh, we're a little lax today, but we're counting on all sessions starting on the dot because we have a very tight schedule. So please try to be in your seats a bit ahead of time for each session. And don't forget in the mornings to allow some time to go through security as you enter the museum. Uh, now, before we turn the podium over to Wanda Korn of Stanford University, who will moderate the first session this afternoon, I would like to ask Elizabeth Glassman, President and CEO of the Terra Foundation, to come forward and share with us some of the foundation's goals and experiences. And I say a big hand for Elizabeth Glassman. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Cynthia. We're really thrilled to be here. And it gives me great pleasure to speak briefly on behalf of everyone at the Terra Foundation for American Art and to welcome all of you, many friends, many colleagues. I've never spoken to a web audience, but we welcome you too. And hopefully many of you will also be future partners with the Foundation in our goal of being an international resource for American art. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate the Smithsonian Institution, its directors, board, curators, staff, everyone who's worked so hard to make this wonderful building a reality on the opening of the Reynolds Center, which I consider the trifecta of American art, the National Portrait Gallery, the Archives of American Art, and SAM, which includes the Loose Study Center. Uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum has collected, exhibited, and interpreted American art for over 160 years. In that time, our notions about the study of the subject have been set and reset countless times. I think we all recognize that in every period, our look at works of art reveals a good deal about where we are in our own history, even as it elucidates the work of art itself. In our own moment, we recognize Another point of shifting perspective with the addition of the international lens. This adjustment widens our horizons not only to the global perspective, but it also allows us to make deeper connections and to ask more complex cultural questions. Questions of national points of view give way to other considerations, and we not only situate the experience of the artist in a global map, we open the discourse and welcome scholars from an international arena to include diverse points of view about American art. This international lens informs all of what we do at the Terra Foundation. And here I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the enlarged Terra, the division of the Terra Foundation. In the larger sense, we have taken as our charge, and this is from our mission statement, to further the cross-cultural dialogue on American art. Our goal is to enrich understanding because, in quotes again in our mission statement, implicit in such activities is the belief that art has the potential to both distinguish cultures and to unite them. Among the ways that the Terra Foundation fulfills this mission is in supporting exhibitions and conferences. Some of the scholars speaking today have been part of our international residency program, which brings together scholars from the US and Europe. One of our speakers is, in fact, from our own international team of curators. Working with the Smithsonian, the Terra is pleased, as Maelia said, to have funded several projects, including this symposium, all of which demonstrate our, our support for an international dialogue. The Terra Digitization Project at the Archives of American Art will make 1.6 million digital files available free to the public on the web. Researchers from Washington to Warsaw will have access to this primary resource for American art in the archives website. The Terra also supports SAM's residency fellowships. 
And this year, the fellowships were filled by three international scholars. I hope you'll all meet them during the course of the next two days, which we feel adds another perspective to the already very rich mix of dialogues present in the museum's longstanding fellowship program. This has been a very exciting year for the Terra Foundation as we have seen projects in American art taking shape in Germany, Poland, France, England, Italy. We are in contact with exhibitions in Mexico, Peru, China, and this is just a beginning of a long list uh, that we're involved with. Between our fellowships, travel grants, and symposia, we have supported and also been inspired by over 100 scholars like yourselves. Part of the richness of every conference is the exchange that takes place. And for our part, we look forward to hearing your papers and to meeting and talking to each one of you as together we enlarge our thinking on American art. It is one of the goals of the Terra Foundation that encounters such as these will go beyond any single meeting and will begin to form the basis of real long-term conversations and collaborations. If an, I if an idea takes root for you, and I'm sure many will, um, please visit our website. Contact us. Know that a foundation success is formed and informed by your creative proposals. On the website, you will find not only our entire collection, information about our exhibition partnerships, and a listing of grants that we have awarded, but in the next month, you will also find online a copy of our report, uh, second report, which is coming out, um, will be in a PDF online, and we hope it will provide for you a snapshot of the Terra Foundation as it currently exists. In closing, I just want to add one personal note of thanks, <clears throat> and that is to the Foundation's very dedicated board. We have three board members in the audience today. Kathy Foster, the McNeil Curator of American Art at the Philadelphia Museum, Fred Vogel, collector, connoisseur from Milwaukee, and Wanda Korn, who will launch the symposium with a look, as she always does, at the big picture. In addition, I want to thank the very hardworking and highly professional staff at the Terra. I, I feel very privileged to work with this talented group. Please introduce yourselves. I was going to have them stand, but it's too dark. But look at our badges. Introduce. There's quite a number of us here from both France and from Chicago. Let us know what you're thinking. I know I speak for all of us when I say that we really look forward to hearing from you, not only in the next few days, but in the years to come. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the kickoff uh, panel called The Big Picture uh, for our symposium um, this weekend. I, I think I'd like to just turn the tables. You know, usually we say all our thank yous at the end of two and a half days when we're exhausted uh, and uh, we haven't uh, perhaps uh, known exactly who the big players were. Well, you've met them already, but I just would like to ask Cindy Mills and Amelia Gerlitz if you would stand up there. Both, did Amelia just go away? There she is. <laughs> I can tell you from personal contact with these two women, they have done it all. And uh, every single bit of script that you see, all the folders, all the um, special touches that a convention requires uh, is due to their very uh, careful and diligent and creative um, efforts. And let me also welcome uh, all of you here. I know many have traveled from other parts in the United States, but also we have people, of course, who have traveled from other countries. Uh, and we're just delighted to have the um, diversity and mix in our group today. And I suppose I should wave to wherever the webcast broadcast is happening, uh, because who, know my, who knows whom um, who may be looking and from what countries, but one of the exciting, uh, this unfortunately couldn't be announced until relatively recently because it wasn't a sure thing until relatively recently, but uh, it is possible to be watching in real time. Uh, that's going to be uh, 
three o'clock in the morning for some cultures, but <laughs> it is possible to, to do this, and it's also being archived. So I, as I understand it, you'll be able to write, call it up, and if you've missed a paper or um, you, know, you want your mother to see you giving a paper, uh, <laughs> The possibilities um, are there. In fact, if you're not giving a paper today, you could call your mother tonight, and she could be watching tomorrow on a, on a PC. Cynthia asked me to kind of set the stage for the symposium, uh, though she has done very well herself just now. Um, and in so doing, what I think I might say, as part of uh, introductory remarks, is that I, it occurs to me that we have three major pieces of business over the course of the next uh, couple of days. The first will be the easiest, which will be collegiality and celebration. Even if the papers are a disaster, we know that collegiality <laughs> and celebration are not um, uh, going to be affected. We are an international gathering. We're teachers, we're curators, we're collectors, we're docents, we're students, um, we're interns. And what we all have in common is an investment in keeping the study of American art healthy, innovative, and relevant. Uh, so naturally, like we would at any convention, we will have our one-on-ones or two-on-two conversations in the foyers, upstairs in the galleries, uh, in the receptions. Uh, but I would like to ask, and this has already been underlined by the previous remarks, that you not only chat with old friends and familiar faces, but you go out of your way to meet new make new friends uh, and introduce yourselves to new faces, not only our guests from abroad, but per, uh, the Terra staff members that are here and other visitors uh, that will be part of our um, gathering. The celebration, of course, is the reopening of SAM and the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and this has been truly, as you've, those of you who've been able to visit today, uh, a remarkable uh, reinvention of those two museums and also a reinvention of a fantastic piece of architecture whose historic bones uh, we've never been able to see with such clarity. Uh, the, the handsomeness of the structure is part of what has been reintroduced to us with the opening this past um, uh, summer. And I, too, join with others in congratulating the staffs uh, of both those museums uh, for their brilliant reinstallations. And I just have to add a personal note, having spoken uh, at SAM when it was everything from NCFA to uh, ENMA and other things, recreations, this is the first time I've ever spoken in such a handsome space in the patent office. And I know many of you will remember where we used to speak. <laughs> and uh, how few people could be in that room at one time with no raked seating, it was a multi-purpose space, uh, and it simply never was able to live up to the reputation uh, of the museum that housed it. So I personally want to thank, I don't know, Nan Tucker McAvoy, if you are watching the webcast uh, uh, out at your vineyards in California, but this is for you. <laughs> Nan has been a commissioner uh, uh, on the uh, SAM board for many terms, uh, has been a very, uh, a very generous uh, donor, and since she, I, she also happens to hail from Northern California, so I know her in the context of um, the de Young Museum, uh, which is part of her family's heritage uh, in my part of the world. Now, the other two pieces of business constitute which, what we will call the intellectual agenda. One, uh, pr having a probing discussion of the variety of ways in which the study of American art is undergoing globalization, uh, the, the, the key word of our conference. And secondly, assuming uh, that we agree that globalization is a good thing, we want to do what uh, Cynthia just referred to as the nuts and bolts discussions of ways in which we might encourage transnational teaching, research, um, and exhibitions. And particularly, we'd like to address with the benefit of our colleagues from other countries how it is that we can make it easier for all of us uh, to gather at occasions like this uh, and join together uh, in the work uh, of the future. I'd like to make a few remarks about these two intellectual agendas, especially the first, the definitions of globalization of American art. What is it do we, that we mean by this phrase? 
What I would gather, and this is not thinking particularly in an isolated fashion by myself about the matter, is but by looking at all the titles of the papers and reading the short praises for this conference, it seems to me that globalization means different things. It's not a simple moniker, but a multidimensional descriptor that will take on different shapes throughout the conference. To grasp the concept in its entirety, I suggest, we're going to have to employ a thick description, not a thin one, of what we mean by this term. To get the discussion going, here are three ways that I see the G word embedded uh, in this particular program. The first is expanding the canon to include artists of foreign birth or heritage, immigrant artists who are bi or tricultural, borderland artists, artists who hop from culture to culture, finally coming to roost in one of them. This meaning of globalization, I do not take to be new, but a continuation of a project underway in art history since the 1970s, a decade in which the so-called new art history began to add women to the canon and artists of color. First African Americans, eventually Latino and Latina artists, Native American artists, and along with them, artists of different um, uh, gender and, and sexual preferences, gay and lesbian artists, uh, or ethnic formations such as artists of Jewish birth and formation. Today, and obviously all of these groups are still expanding uh, in the way in which they uh, do their research and the number of names they're adding to the uh, canon. Uh, it seems, though, that one thing that our conference will show is that the expansion of the canon continues unabated with arguably the Asian American artists getting the most concentrated attention uh, in this particular decade. And that I, uh, I gather from uh, upcoming publications that I know about, exhibitions, encyclopedia, uh, books and studies and the like. This turn to trans-Pacific crossovers between the United States and China, Japan, Korea, India, Pakistan, the list could go on, um, is evidence that identity politics continues to, de to be a major force within scholarship on American art. It seems, in fact, that what we once called identity studies has been absorbed into some of the newer rhetoric of globalization, but it does, it seems to me, remain a vital part of a 30-year project of recovering artists who once were considered marginal or lost altogether to history. And it also was a project that's continued the diversification of a canon that once was lily white, male, and mainstream. A second definition of the G word that emerges from the papers in our symposium is about cultural contact between an American-born or American-trained artist and another country's traditions and culture. This also I take not to be a brand new, but an older agenda in radically new clothing. Looking for exchange and influence from cultures outside the United States into the history or the study of American art has always been an essential part of our discipline. But there are at least two things that are very striking about today's cross-cultural study. The first is that the most familiar paradigm of American-born artists learning their lessons in the art capitals of Europe, particularly Rome, Paris, and London, is expanding to include cultural transmissions from Africa, the Middle East, East and Southeast Asia, Russia, and most prominently, hemispherically, north to Canada and south to Central and South America. Globalization in this way means quite literally looking anywhere in the world where the questions of art take you. Or to put it another way, globalization means asking new questions of art that can't be answered without following leads to other parts of the universe. The globe uh, in our field once shaped something like a dog bone, America at one end and Europe at the other, with a transatlantic voyage in between. And I'm a cat person, not even a dog, but that was the only metaphor I could think of. <laughs> anyway, this dog bone has kind of fleshed out to become a larger and more malleable universe, something perhaps shaped more like a satellite, and I think of the 1950s satellites, with dotted lines leading from the states in all directions to countries around the world. And these dotted lines no longer have little arrows that only go in one direction. Another new feature about cross-cultural contact is that it's likely to be envisioned as a two-way two -way street. 
It's no longer the top-down influence that we study or the ways that a superior culture influenced a provincial one, but rather exchanges between cultures where both the visitor and the native culture are mutually shaped by the encounter. And this is a good segue then to a third kind of globalization that's evident in this conference, and that is the prominent representation of scholars from other countries. Increasingly, we in the States are reading books by and hearing papers from and enjoying invitations from scholars and their um, departments that are formed by very different national cultures who, for whatever reason, have chosen to focus, these scholars have chosen to focus their research on American visual culture. Some of them are young, but some of them have been tending the American field for a long time. But the fact is that we have not interacted regularly with Americanists from other countries, nor have we had full benefit of their multinational perspectives. Personally, I find this, this increased president, presence of non-national voices in the field of American art and our increased contact with one another the most radical intervention of the past decade. It brings new voices and methods into question and questions to the discipline. The benefits, it seems to me, are incalculable and as yet unknown. In fact, I, in thinking about it and trying to be predictive, I thought to myself it would be presumptuous, really, to know exactly what changes cross-cultural scholarly exchanges will bring to the study of American art. Yet I feel certain in my heart that this is a good and healthy turn of events. I welcome this practice of globalization and hope I'm long, around long enough to witness the intellectual changes it will most certainly bring to our field. And then the second piece of business, which Cynthia Mills has already uh, mentioned. And Cynthia asked me, though, to make sure that I underlined the fact that she wants to come out of this conference discussion about um, how we, in fact, foster and increase international participation uh, in the future. And how do we continue to make spaces like this conference where dialogue can happen? This has also been a series of uh, the same kind of questions that the Terra staff and board members, of which I've been a privilege to be a part of, uh, have been asking over the last couple of years. So I've had the privilege of watching both the Terra uh, mature in its understanding of how to foster international exchange, um, but also in conversation with some of our important uh, colleagues Virla Thielmans is here from the Terra. She herself has, it's, it's one of her jobs, in fact, uh, to uh, recognize and help us find colleagues uh, who are doing important work uh, in American art. And she does that from her base um, at the American Art Museum um, in Giverny. You've heard about some of the ways in which the Terra has tried to foster such, and I think not, not tried, but succeeded. The Terra summer fellowships that some of the pre-docs here, or maybe you are now post-docs, hopefully, but you were pre-docs when you went to um, Giverny for uh, a several week period in the summer to work hard in a, a beautiful setting and to get to know uh, senior members of the um, profession, both uh, studio and art history, both from this country and uh, there's always also an artist, a senior artist and a senior art historian or a senior cultural historian uh, from Europe that is in residency. Uh, also, I'm, and I'm sure this will come up, so I'll just breeze over it, but the phenomenon that we've all been watching of American art museum, uh, um, excuse me, American um, exhibitions of American art uh, that have suddenly cropped up in Europe. Most notably, I guess it came to our attention when the American Sublime made such a splash internationally uh, at the Tate. Uh, the Americans in Paris exhibition last year, uh, uh, now touring in this country. I just saw it in Boston. I don't know where it is at this point, but uh, it seems to me it's going someplace else. Met, maybe, is that right? Um, and that was at the National Gallery um, of London. Uh, at the Terra this summer, we saw an exhibition that had been cooperatively curated by the Terra um, and by the Dulwich Picture Gallery in England, an exhibition on Winslow Homer called Poet, Winslow Homer, Poet of the Sea, uh, his first one-person exhibition abroad. Uh, I think Winslow Homer probably had never been seen in more than two paintings at a time, and probably those were in like 
1867 when he was over there for the exposition or something like that. I know there are people here who can correct me or amplify that. Um, and then this summer, an exhibition that was truly um, unusual. That is a, uh, it, it was a small exhibition, but it was the first exhibition of American art ever at the Louvre, uh, which was partnered the Louvre with the Terra curator, curator from each institution. Uh, and uh, the theme of the exhibition was to show works of art by artists who had had some um, important study or time in Paris and that showed their study, excuse me, it, at the Louvre in Paris, but also studying at the Louvre and that showed in the particular work of art that was chosen. And there's been also an exhibition in Krakow of American art recently that the Terra has underwritten. And soon you'll be hearing about 300 years of American art that the Guggenheim is um, an exhibition organized by a team of scholars but headed up by the Guggenheim, which next uh, year, very early in 2007, will open in Beijing and then go on to Shanghai. This morning, uh, the Terra, uh, some of us at the Terra Foundation had the privilege of being shown what's happening online at the Ameri Archives of American Art. And I'm sure they would have loved to have that up and running uh, for this conference, but being the trickiness of all these technologies is that you never quite launch exactly when you think you're going to. But let me just be predictive here for a second about what a change this will make when you can do work research work on your own computer uh, in your own home or wherever you happen to be. The first launch will bring up 12 collections, including the large collection that they have on the Armory Show, papers of Romare Bearden, Winslow Homer, Alexander Calder, Grant Wood, just to give you a, a smattering of names, uh, some 66,000 digital images, uh, and 52 linear feet. I sound like a tour guide here with all these statistics, but I do find it impressive. And the goal is that within the next four or five years to have 100 collections digitalized. And for those of you that are, I know are asking the same question I was, which is, well, do we get the same stuff that we get on microfilm? The answer is yes. <laughs> but the answer is also that it has been primarily re-photographed, so you'll actually be able to read it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you won't, you know, have those blurry eyes uh, that you do at the end of microfilm. Interestingly, we also learned that all this digitalization is being backed up, get this, backed up, preserved by being put on microfilm. Because <laughs> we can't trust the machines to necessarily, or the disks, uh, to hold it. So the microfilms, I don't know, they're putting them in some fireproof vault someplace. Uh, and they're using new microfilms. It won't be the ones that you and I have grown up on. Okay, now these are activities that are all in, in, in process um, and uh, obviously uh, are indicative of, uh, we, are, we are part of uh, what this uh, trend is all about, this conference. But what are other things, what other kinds of activities have we heard from our European colleagues? Well, I just might mention a few of them and I hope people will address these later on in discussions. First, the need for the translation of key texts uh, in, that are presently in English about American art into other languages. And I would say the opposite, too. Key texts that are presently in French or German or Japanese about American art, we need to get translated so that we can easily, especially we Americans who are so um, unilinguistic, uh, can, can read. We obviously, there never will be enough opportunities for trans-Pacific, trans-Atlantic, um, trips south of the border, north of the border for research and exchange. So the idea of increasing travel fellowships, there are some already for non-nationals, uh, increasing the trend uh, at SAM for having um, international fellows, the three that are here, two are from France, one is, uh, is, is Japanese-born. Um, we need to, although interestingly, uh, different uh, people have told us different things about this, depending on what country they come from, but some countries need desperately, they feel better history uh, museums or uh, better art libraries. His, they need uh, history of American art books and libraries that they can have easy access to. Uh, there's also a cry for more opportunities to see American art outside the United States, especially pre-1945 art, and we may want to talk about that, um, that wall uh, that always crops up around 45. Uh, interesting, we now know how many American paintings are in collections uh, in France, thanks to a survey that was done and completed this past summer, and is that up online? 
already, so you can uh, check that out by going into the Terra website and you'll get a link to it. Um, and also there is a similar survey being taken to find out what American artworks are in collections um, in England, and we hope that will spread and, and mushroom uh, to making similar kinds of surveys in other um, countries. And then the, the sort of troublesome uh, or hard to figure out uh, request for more teaching about American art in countries in other places. Presently, it is primarily the Fulbright um, uh, full fellowship program or, or work program, work study program, uh, that supports this kind of teaching. And we have at least, I think, two people here, Laura Katzman and Erica Doss, uh, who have recently taught, uh, Laura in Germany and um, uh, Erica in Sweden, uh, and I hope they will speak up about their um, experiences. I know one thing they will say, which is something we hear constantly from our colleagues, which is the fundamental difference as to where art history, the history of American art, gets taught here and in other countries. In our country, obviously, the history of American art is usually in an art history department, um, and that's true uh, also in England. But in other countries, American art is commonly taught in what we would call American studies programs by scholars who were trained in similar kinds um, of, uh, of uh, programmatic bases. The study of art, in other words, is part of the study of American culture writ um, large. It's not that art history programs don't exist in those countries, they do, but they don't teach American art, probably don't even recognize American art. Uh, uh, but uh, so when American art is taught, it's going to be uh, found under the rubric of uh, uh, American um, studies. And that rubric is supported by a very hardy, strong, widespread set of regional and national associations of American studies. And as some of you know who pay attention to what's going on in ASA in this country, they have made it their top priority in the last few years to become an activist organization with what they call an international initiative. Shelley Fishkin, uh, Fisher Fishkin, who uh, was president in 0405, happens to be a colleague at Stanford. And I asked her where she had spoken in her year there, and I asked her because I knew She's the chair of our American Studies program at Stanford, but I also knew that almost every other week, it seemed to me, she was on an airplane going to uh, represent American uh, ASA in other countries. She wrote back that she spoke in that one year to the European Biennial Association meetings in Prague, to the Irish ASA in Cork, the British ASA in Cambridge, the ASA of Korea in Seoul, the Japanese AAS in Kyoto, uh, she also spoke in Shanghai, St. Petersburg, um, and Taipei. So the, what's happening there is really, uh, um, I, I think they're kind of ahead of us in our history, um, the way in which they've sought funding, for instance, for international scholars to come to ASA meetings. I think Shelley said there was something like 50 scholars can now be subsidized to come to meetings, but also to help uh, ASA associations abroad bring Americans uh, to uh, them. So the bottom line is that uh, we need to work with our colleagues in, from, in other countries. Um, we also, I think, need to be a force. Art history is, uh, has been a force in recent years, but perhaps even a stronger force within ASA uh, to um, help with this an international um, initiative. Finally, I think in thinking to the future, we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean for our teaching? or curating, um, and this a question that the ASA sessions have begun already to address. But I hope that there's a moment somewhere in our conference uh, for you who have reshaped your courses to address transnational goals uh, to speak up. I know that one uh, person I was in touch with who's not yet here but will be here um, I think this evening, Elizabeth Hutchinson, told me about a very experimental but creative out-of-the-box course being taught at Columbia University this quarter called Multiple Modernities. Uh, and what it has done is brought, brought together specialists who can speak on contemporary art uh, in Africa, South Asia, China, the Islamic Near East, and Native America. Uh, very interesting way of reshaping uh, the, the um, curriculum, and they're hoping to put some volume together. Well, I'm sure there's plenty others of you that have ideas uh, or are trying ideas or looking for ways to launch 
new curricula and that you will uh, speak up. So it's important, I think, that we leave this symposium with new ideas, new roadmaps, um, and actually I hope we even have some suggestions for our, our peer group in art history broadly considered. I don't know that we should be the only group, national group, thinking about globalization. I would hope that other art, his, uh, art historians of other fields uh, will be thinking along similar lines and we uh, may be able to address that as well. Some rules of the road, uh, and Cindy's already uh, underlined them. She does want to begin on time, but she also wanted me to mention that moderators are going to generally give very minimal introductions to the speakers all in a uh, group at the beginning so we don't have to be hopping up and down. If you want the longer biographies, they're in your packet uh, for each of the um, speakers. And, and to also to ask the speakers stay within their allotted time. We will have time for discussion this afternoon, uh, if speakers don't do that. Uh, but also today was particularly planned as a launching day and so we have written in some uh, a time for discussion at the end and we hope within reason we can find some chunks of, of uh, discussion times uh, in the next two days. So the big picture panelists that you'll be hearing, and I will give one of these sort of block introductions, will begin with Angela Miller, uh, who teaches art history and American studies at Washington University in St. Louis, and is known for uh, her work of recent date uh, with five, working with other scholars to put out a new American textbook. Winfried Fluke is professor and chair of American culture at the John F. Kennedy Institute for North American Studies at the Freie Universität Berlin. And among other things, uh, he is organizing an international symposium to be held in Berlin uh, in late May called Narratives in American Art. John Norega is professor of UCLA in the Department of Film, Television, and Digital Media and an adjunct curator, I don't know how he does all this, at the Los Angeles County Museum. And he has done many projects in the past and has many projects that you will see in his biog underway on Latino and Latina artists. Margot Machida teaches art history and Asian American studies uh, at the University of Connecticut and is a very active scholar and critic uh, and writes on and has a big book coming out about contemporary Asian American artists. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, Angela, I'll ask you to kick us off. Hi, everybody, and I'm very, very honored to be here. Let me get used to the lights uh, today and um, want to make some uh, general comments. I'm not going to be speaking on the survey text as uh, was promised, um, and um, all I can say is that I'm sure you will be more excited by that book than I am at the moment. <laughs> Having I'm a little bit too steeped in it to get excited about it. So I'm going to, I'm, what I want to do today is, that is coming out in 2007, uh, and some of the remarks I'm going to make will, will sort of allude to that. Um, we have, I'm very happy to say we have two, three of uh, the team of six here, uh, Jennifer Roberts and Margaret Lovell are also here. Um, so feel free to ask us questions about the survey text. But what I'd like to do now is to um, frame, um, I also want to say that, that uh, to, to uh, repeat, Wanda's admiration for the new uh, installation. It's absolutely stunning, and I'm really delighted to be here. But I want to frame a series of questions and reflections, um, some of which I hope will stay with you uh, through the conference, on what exactly we mean by the global turn. This is going to um, obviously build on uh, Wanda's very helpful um, introductory remarks. Um, what we mean by not only the global turn, but also by cosmopolitanism and its discontents, uh, because the cosmopolitan is one of the ways in which to frame this material. It was used in the um, publicity for this uh, symposium, and it has become something of a buzzword in contemporary art discourse. Um, but also what these terms might forecast for the future of our field uh, as Americanists. Um, <clears throat> the title of our conference, now I can see you. <laughs> uh, 
The title of our conference, American Art in a Global Context, as some of you may have noted, uh, repositions rather than dethrones the central role of the nation as our object of study. For better or worse, it retains the preeminence of the nation over other possible formations. We are certainly not here to uh, overthrow American art uh, as a discrete field of study. That would mean joblessness, or at least different jobs for most of us. But it might be salutary to at least consider what a non-hierarchical or fully post-national study of art made in the United States might look like, if only to make us more self-conscious of the assumptions that are embedded in how most of us do American art. Um, there is a problem or paradox at the heart of this conference. Um, that is the, uh, the question as to whether American art can be at once national and global. Um, can an, an artist or a writer or a citizen be simultaneously at home in the world and in the nation state? Uh, being at home in the world is my sort of working definition of co the cosmopolitan. Or must artists and citizens choose among these allegiances? Uh, it's a question worth asking with respect to our most famous cosmopolitans, Sargent, Whistler, Henry James is the portrait of James by Sargent, uh, Mary Cassatt. Are they cosmopolitans, uh, dispatriots in the uh, terms of Peter Wollen? Or are they expatriates, Americans by birth or parentage who merely chose to live in Europe? Or did they change their affiliations in a strategic manner that served different audiences at different moments in their careers, a sort of third alternative? What do we mean by global anyway? Um, is it the same as calling for a greater cosmopolitanism? Uh, and what do we mean by cosmopolitan? As Stéphane Bourgeois, who was a gallery dealer and promoter of American art, wrote in 1922, the art of the future will be cosmopolitan and not racial or nationalistic. And here in America, where all the races of the earth mingle their blood and ideas, this process elaborates itself now with greater rapidity than elsewhere. Bourgeois' formulation is quite striking in the way it anticipates uh, some of the things we're talking about today. This formulation suggests the persistence of the national here in America, even alongside his ringing endorsement of the cosmopolitan ideal. There are other fissures in this term cosmopolitan, which suggests a citizen of the world, but it lays claim, to, and in doing so, it lays claim to a certain universality. But isn't such a citizen of the world already privileged by his or her own position at the metropolitan center rather than at the margins? Don't the circuits of knowledge, ideas, forms, and people that sustain the cosmopolitan vision always flow through these global cities as centers of power? Cosmopolitanism has always had something of an elitist ring to it. It is a voluntary, constructed identity in a world where growing numbers of men, women, and children have lost their homes to war and genocide. I myself like and admire the concept of the cosmopolitan, but I think we need to use it with a full sense of its multiple ironies. But to return to the question of the relationship of the American to the global, far from working against one another, the American and the global, if by that we mean contact and exchange with other cultures, these two things often reinforce one another, though, though not always in uh, expected or salutary ways. Though the travel and exposure to other cultures is supposed to encourage a more cosmopolitan identity, it often reinforces a sense of national difference, uh, a truth many of us have experienced at first hand as we observe or participate in boorishly insistent behavior of Americans, for which Americans are notorious in foreign places. How many times have we self-styled cosmopolitans acted in pushy and pig-headed ways when we come up against the intransigence and blank incomprehension of other cultural systems. I was just in China, so I speak of myself here. Um, cosmopolitanism, in its best sense, in short, is not a reflexive response that follows automatically from exposure to other cultures. It is a state of cultivated suspension between and among cultures, one for which travel and cultural exchange is a necessary precondition, but not a guarantee. The global is linked through a common root to a related term, globalization, and Wanda did a good job, I thought, of untangling some of these uh, terms, although the two terms should not be conflated. 
Globalization has a rather specific meaning in the postmodern context, referring to the mobility of information and images in the virtual environments of the digital era, as distinct, as distinct from the global nature of commerce and trade concurrent with the formation of the nation state, and indeed much, much older. Commerce, as we know from the example of the great world's fairs of the 19th century, vastly enriched the languages of art and design, introducing new materials and non-Western influences into American art, even as it reinforced the hierarchy of imperial center over colonial periphery. Postmodern globalization, by contrast, has the potential to undermine the nation, the national, as the primary referent of experience. Yet, economic globalization often stands in an inverted relationship to cosmopolitanism. In other words, the two by no means go hand in hand. I'm sure many here have had occasion to wonder over the past five years about the paradox of an ever more deterritorialized or global corporate culture of transnational capital, labor, and production on the one hand, and on the other, a resurgent and virulent nationalism that has earned the US opprobrium around the world. Given these complexities and contradictions, it is not surprising that the conjoined terms American and global might inspire mixed reactions. Many of us here will find in it a chastening, but also stimulating new awareness of interrelationality, one that issues from our understanding of the multiple debts and influences that have shaped our culture, the international conversations that have fueled our greatest innovators, and the extent to which our culture has always been defined not by static, essential, or ahistorical qualities embedded in our unique national mythologies, but by exchanges with Europe, Africa, and Asia. This, I hope, um, is the primary lesson of our recently completed Survey of American Art, co-authored by a team of six. Um, each of us dedicated to the vision of a truly pluralistic account of the arts in America. At the same time, we like to think of our book as pressing beyond multiculturalism in that we see these various traditions as not as self-contained or insular, not in terms of fixed cultural identities, but as mobile, strategically flexible, and pragmatically adaptive. American and global suggest a new post-national spirit of generosity toward the range of cultures in our midst along with a seasoned understanding of our responsibilities as citizens of the world. These responsibilities are hampered by our insistence on the model of a mainstream culture, a model that has served the nation state very well indeed, but which may have outlived its usefulness in a pluralistic world. Um, this is not the cover of the book, but it's of course from uh, Ansel Adams' book on Manzanar, the um, internment camp of uh, Japanese Americans. Um, but these two conjoined terms, American and global, also carry other more troubling associations. This double-edged character is embodied in the new Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, a cutting-edge design by an internationally famous brand name architect, one which serves a corporate vision of a highly marketable export, Guggenheim Inc., with branches in Berlin, Venice, Las Vegas, and in 2007, Rio. Framed this way, the Guggenheim Bilbao signifies to some a new American triumphalism. Those critical of Bilbao find in its sensuously glittering form set amidst the old Basque city a certain presumption that the American way offers a model for the rest of the world. This presumption is driven as well by our awareness of uh, our popular culture of Hollywood, Hilton hotels, hip hop, and fast food that has long since been successfully exported to much of the world. Indeed, the spectacular appearance of Bilbao, Guggenheim, <clears throat> of Guggenheim, uh, in Bilbao has been criticized for miming other forms of uh, popular spectacle. The rapid export of our American culture is also in many instances underwritten by a market ideology of free choice that is in turn linked to the presumed spread of democratic institutions. We are all familiar with the ways in which everything from black jazz musicians <clears throat> to abstract expressionism were made to perform this ambassadorial role in Penny Von Eschen's terms. Also, Martha Bales is, going to, is, is using that term in her talk to, uh, at the conference. And these um, 
uh, ambassadors, cultural ambassadors made to stand in for the American cultural values of free expression during the Cold War. It behooves us to remember such examples of what has been termed um, by critical American study scholars neo-imperialist cosmopolitanism as a cautionary tale lurking in any discussion of American art in a global context. American elites may be no more or less self-absorbed than those of other nation states in their conversations with the world, but the difference lies in the military and economic power wielded by the U.S. as a superpower, however delusory that uh, power may be. Um, so in other words, a call to um, humility in the face of these um, historical uh, challenges. Um, it is critical, therefore, and I'm probably preaching to the converted here, that as Americanists strive to be less parochial, less insulated from international and comparative context, and I also want to thank the Terra for the uh, amazing um, uh, role that they've played in really promoting these kinds of exchanges, that we also remain sensitive to lingering assumptions of exceptionalism, assumptions that drive a widely shared conviction that we are destined to propagate our culture as much as our democratic liberalism throughout the world. Let us distinguish then two forms of the global, two good and bad forms of global positioning. A guiding premise of this conference, if I can make it explicit, is that the construction of the nation state as an insular, self-contained um, political, economic, and cultural entity runs up against a multitude of commercial and cultural exchanges that have long been a part of national life, transatlantic and transpacific, uh, circuits of books, ideas, artists, social networks, tastemakers, and treatises, uh, and works of art themselves that follow the same route as other forms of trade. Americanists for many generations have been quite aware of these transatlantic circuits, as, we, uh, as we've seen already and heard already, um, and I won't uh, give you examples. Um, but I would like to simply ask what distinguishes uh, these, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, another view of uh, Bill, but I wanted to point out that this is, this, the, the view from this end is, is very different from the view within the context of the Basque City, and to suggest that these different ways of framing Bill Bao um, serve rather different uh, points of view. Um, but I want to dis ask what distinguishes those older forms of um, scholarship in American art uh, in interest in, in, interest in uh, transatlantic uh, uh, and European influences from, for instance, the Whit Whitney's planned exhibition on Picasso and the American avant-garde, um, what distinguishes these two uh, generations of scholarship? And I understand from a former student working on this exhibition that it represents, on, uh, in the Whitney's terms, an effort to explore American art in a global context, um, certainly a mission at the Whitney that has already been explored in the 2006 biennial, uh, which included non-American citizens, it, was, it, uh, it uh, stirred quite a bit of discussion, um, citizens who work or live in the U.S., um, but who often were not uh, native-born, in recognition in their terms of the increasingly borderless nature of American culture. Now, this is not to criticize this new approach, but rather to suggest that perhaps we have always been global without knowing it or proclaiming it. But as I suggested, um, there are many ways of being global. One new feature of the global turn, and this has already been anticipated by Wanda's uh, comments, um, is that we're looking much farther afield uh, from Europe for sources of cultural influence and exchange. We now look to conversations that uh, cut across the grain of mainstream uh, or high cultural exchange, African-American culture in Japan, just to name a few of the talks at the symposium, African-American artists in Africa, diasporic Asian and Latin American affiliations with home cultures across national boundaries, exile and immigration, um, to name just a few. Studies of cultural exchange are also expanding to include early film as well as cartoons and animation. Um, and I'm um, alluding here to Na Nancy Matthews' talk, which I think charts a different direction as well, uh, or to um, recent work by Esther Leslie in 2002, Hollywood Flatlands, Animation, Critical Theory, and the European Avant-Garde. This is a drawing by Mata in our collection which I think was inspired by uh, Daffy Duck, uh, as you can see from the image on the lower right. What is that? Um... Okay. Um, another area of research whose time is still to come is the United States in terms of its hemispheric identity, also anticipated by Wanda's remarks. 
Um, this hemispheric organization has already been put into place in museums, uh, which I think are taking the lead here, uh, most recently at the de Young, which at least makes a stab at this, but also most fully at the Brooklyn and other collections which mix uh, contem contemporaneous art of the United States, uh, the Catholic Southwest, Mexico, and Peru in a manner that further undermines the exceptionalist and insular focus on the internal unfolding of a national tradition. I would also point to Kathy Manthorne and uh, Francis Pohl's work on exchanges between U.S. and Latin America and U.S. and Canada. As we pursue such new directions, we need to refine and broaden our concept of influence to include the complex play of resistance, selection, productive misunderstanding, and new synthesis that accompanies all acts of cultural exchange and transmission. Um, this is um, William Williams' portrait of Deborah Hall next to an 18th century Peruvian painting and two examples of Chippendale and its international uh, forms, Philadelphia and, Rio, and uh, <clears throat> Argentina. Um, we might uh, do well then to think of American arts and architecture as a kind of energy field that is continually taking in outside influences and assimilating these into its internal systems while simultaneously exporting forms, prototypes, technical influences, and models throughout the world, both with specific ideological agendas and through more passive means. In terms of how we have performed as Americanists in the past, these examples suggest both continuity and change, a redirection from notions of one-way influence, again, as Wanda has said, uh, to a more theoretically informed understanding of the complicated cultural politics, not only of reception and transmission, but also of professional networks, international business, global... <laughs> global cities and international media, all of which play a role in propelling exchange. Okay, I'm coming to an end here. Um, if I had a title for my talk, I would call it The World is Flat, partly as a satirical thrust at Thomas Friedman's best-selling book, because of course we all know that the world is not flat, as it is currently constituted at least, and that the cultural playing field is not, e is not even, in spite of Friedman's ardent fantasy, that it is so. Friedman's vision of a flat world will affect all of us decisively. From such a point of view, dissolving the nation state as an analytical concept means to run away from the task, from the continuing task of analyzing American society and culture in its specificity. Politically speaking, the internationalization of American studies and potentially the study of American art is a highly welcome development, of course, because, as this conference testifies, it increases dialogue and exchange. But analytically speaking, at least from my view from abroad, the enlarged comparative perspective made possible by this internationalization should not give up its focus on American society and culture, its power, its amazing mechanisms of consensus building, its use of culture, and if you want, it's transnationalism. After all, one of the key slogans of American exceptionalism, the phrase only in America, is also an often overlooked key phrase in Randolph Bourne's founding essay on American transnationalism. To put it differently, in view of the many eye-openers of the last years, we, knew an, we need a new version of Tocqueville's democracy in America. Now back to the Hudson River School. <laughs> when we speak of the Hudson River School today, we are actually talking about two different phenomena. The historical Hudson River School and the Hudson River School after its rediscovery in the 30s and especially after World War II. Historically, as we know now, what Cole and other painters presented was not the American landscape per se, but a construct, imbuing, as Angela Miller puts it in a wonderfully succinct phrase, the mute geography of nature with a cultural program. This program was closely connected with themes and topics of an emergent cultural nationalism articulated by conservative anti-Jacksonian elites who discovered landscaped art as supreme cultural expression of national identity, 
and used idealized images of nature, history, myth, and the Bible as a form of cultural criticism to counter the threats of modernity and continuing democratization. For this group, Cole was welcome, as Angela Miller puts it, as the voice of moral opposition to America's materially driven democracy. The grandiose, sublimesque, and picturesque aesthetics of these paintings emerges in this context as a new, sensuously highly effective form of cultural authorization, which gains additional force by the fact that it is linked with images of spiritual revelation. But the case is, of course, more complicated because the Hudson River School we are talking about today is no longer that of the Jacksonian period. From this perspective, the aesthetic dimension of these paintings is no longer culturally determined to the same degree and therefore deserves a second look. Although developments are never linear and straightforward, one can recognize an unmistakable direction in American landscape painting, an increase in theatricality with a corresponding retreat of moral and even transcendent, and transcendent meanings, until in paintings like Niagara, Heart of the Andes, Cotopaxi, and Twilight in the Wilderness, we are beginning to have representations of pure force, threatening voids, and flaming skies, in which divine revelation seems to emanate from sheer matter, and authorization seems to derive no longer from divine will, but from what could be called aestheticization. In church, this aestheticization goes in two directions at once. On the one hand, a spectacular theatrical mode, and on the other, a strong element of naturalization towards sheer presence that manifests itself in church's great emphasis on detail and anticipates, although still in somewhat disguised form, the strong emphasis on factuality and thingness that characterizes much of 20th century American art. And it is these highly spectacular chromoramas, a term Martin Christadler has used, that have shaped our image of American landscape paintings of the Hudson River School and by implication of American art of the 19th century. This is true for the US but especially so for Europe, where it has become almost a habit to use the flaming sky iconography and the massive naturalism of American natural landscape painting as key image for the unique quality of American art of the 19th century. Let me give you a few examples, primarily from Europe, but also from the US. For example, this is the cover of the catalog of the exhibition at the Belvedere in Vienna, which I already mentioned. Angela Miller's cover has a predecessor in Barbara Novak's Nature and Culture, which also shows a detail from Church Twilight in the Wilderness. This is the cover of the catalog of a major exhibition at the Tate Britain in 2002. And this is the cover of a catalog of an exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 2003, which seems to depart from the pattern, as many American publications do, which prefer not to show flaming skies, <laughs> but the civilized middle landscape. <laughs> but when we open the volume, we are back again to the flaming sky. <laughs> In approaching American art of the 19th century, these covers seem to announce that we can expect something spectacular, something grand as in Grand Canyon, but also grand as in grandiose exaggeration, <laughs> in which the artist has become a performer and salesman. A sense of spectacle that was already anticipated in Cole's epic series, The Course of Empire, and there especially in the consummation of empire and in destruction, of course. Both of them epics equally worthy of cinema scope. 
Indeed, many scholars have stressed the overt theatricality of Cole's allegorical series. I therefore do not see, as Bill Trotner has done, any schizophrenia in the two Thomas Coles, the romantic landscape painter and the painter of historical allegories. In effect, the sublime and the transcendent on the one hand and theatrical showmanship on the other seem to go together effortlessly to form a new type of painting that can be considered unique. No matter how many traces of Salvador Rosa, Claude Lorrain, and Caspar David Friedrich can be found in Cole and Church. It was Tocqueville who already emphasized this strong element of performance in American culture, actually at the time of the emergence of the Hudson River School. And it was the American Ben White Brooks, who claimed that the actual key to American culture would be that it was neither highbrow nor lowbrow, but something else, a third type of culture that presents a new type of culture in modernity. I know that the Terror Foundation and other institutions, in their laudable attempts to further the study of American art before 1945, are desperately trying to separate highbrow from lowbrow. But they should not be separated. And the covers I have shown, as the covers I have shown demonstrate, the American landscape painting that we see today is one after hyperrealism and pop art, which in its conflation of high and low has taken the embarrassment out of glaring colors and thus also of flaming skies. As a consequence, this type of landscape painting looks modern today and not quaint at all. One might even argue in conclusion that at least in public perception, it has long overshadowed the painters it has been set to imitate or with which it has been set to exchange influences. Or to put it differently, it has successfully absorbed and transformed its roots, no matter whether these roots were American or transnational. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd also like to begin by thanking uh, the Smithsonian and the Terra Foundation for uh, bringing this event together. And uh, just note that my talk resonates with the speakers and with our moderator, but I promise to show you different slides. Uh, when I first learned that the title of this panel would be Looking for the Big Picture, uh, this etching done in, in 2004 came immediately to mind. The artist is a young Chicana named Ana Medina who lives in Orange County. When I first uh, saw this work, I thought, wow, what a big picture. Here's a, a human figure dwarfed by an elephant, although at a comfortable scale. And the elephant is dwarfed by two ancient statues that look vaguely Assyrian or Egyptian, but that also conjure up the Buddha of Bamiyan that were destroyed by the Taliban in March 2001. The piece is called White Elephant. And as you know, a white elephant is a supposedly valuable possession whose high maintenance exceeds its usefulness, making it into a liability. As a gift, then, a white elephant can be like a Trojan horse, something that will bring financial ruin to one's enemies. But it can also be something sacred or a sign of good luck, no doubt derived from its role as one of the protectors of Buddha. I start with this image for two reasons. First, the artist is one of a number of Chicano artists in Southern California who are not from East LA and whose work falls outside the curatorial and critical framework established for Chicano art. I won't belabor this point, but a Google search using Chicano art found this image. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> Cheech, of course, is a major collector of Chicano art, and his exhibition has been touring the country for several years, and in fact, I would argue he's more well-known than Chicano art. 
Now, Cheech and I have known each other for almost 20 years, and here's a photograph of us, uh, in which he is standing on my right, so that the caption can read Cheech and Sean. I waited about 18 years to get this photograph. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> uh, second, the work speaks to the conundrum of looking for the big picture, the big picture. The piece is titled White Elephant, but clearly the statues dwarf that figure. And who made the statues? Well, the tiniest figure in the image, of course. The, statue repre the statues represent the human figure as the fulcrum between the particular and the universal. And no white elephant can protect such imaginings. So what is represented by this white elephant in terms of the big picture or a global context? Is the white elephant a gift to the world, either as a protector or as something that will end up costing much more than its usefulness? Is the white elephant America and the human figure an art critic? And the statues, the art world, that is the global context for American art? If so, then perhaps America finds itself in a global context of its own making. Or is the white elephant art itself, an expensive yet non-instrumental object, led by a human, again, perhaps an art critic, and dwarfed by what Marshall McLuhan called the extensions of man? What is most interesting about this etching is that it is just two inches tall. It puts scale into perspective, so to speak. I think that such perspective is useful in taking up the question of the global context for American art. Now, I first heard um, that we had moved beyond the old paradigm of what is American about American art back in 1992 when I served as an advisor for the 1993 biennial of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Of course, at the time, I thought that I had been brought there to thicken and complicate the notion of what constituted American art. And so did the press, which blasted the exhibition as being more concerned with cultural diversity than with aesthetics, as if the two were mutually exclusive. But something else was actually happening. The museum was trying to escape its sole focus on American art, using this exhibition as a way to define a global framework for its min uh, mission. And in fact, they included Mexican and Canadian artists uh, who are beginning to branch out uh, in that exhibition. Now, as advisor, I presented the work of 30 Chicano artists representing a diverse array of ar artistic practices, arguing quite earnestly for the museum to move beyond what I called its Adam and Eve approach to Chicano art. One man, one woman, per biennial. <laughs> I won't rehearse those arguments here, but suffice to say that the Whitney responded to this challenge. They selected two men. <laughs> Adam and Steve. <laughs> and they did so in a way that was consistent with earlier selections of Chicano art. That is, the selections satisfied expectations that Chicano art was either political or folk. This is Daniel Martinez and Miguel Gander. What concerned me most, however, was the way in which the Whitney was using the concept of borders as developed by Chicano artists in order to move beyond a national project that now required inclusion of Chicano artists. As you can imagine, the experience instilled within me a certain skepticism towards the invocation of new paradigms on global context. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it is critical that we view ourselves in a global context. But doing so is not new, just perhaps different. In this respect, it is important to remember that even American exceptionalism and American isolationism operate in a global context. In fact, they really don't make sense otherwise. Furthermore, shifting to the global in no way undoes the question of who do we mean when we say we. As Mark Twain would say, the death of the nation as a critical and social concern is greatly exaggerated. I would like to elaborate by reading a portion of a four-page letter that I wrote to the Whitney once their selections were announced in early 1993. Um, while this document is very much an artifact of its time, there are perhaps some useful resonances with our present concerns. And this may seem long. Um, it's about the middle of the letter. It is widely understood that the Whitney Museum is moving in the direction of exhibiting non-American art. As such, the use of the concept of borders provides an intermediary step toward opening the door to international art, especially Latin American art. For Latino artists, this is an all too familiar cutting edge that has been used to cut them out of the picture. And I'll step aside to say at that time, there were actually quite a number of exhibitions with border in the title, even US-Mexico border, but no Chicano artist, and often no Mexican artist either. 
The evolving role of the Whitney Museum has been a subject of much press in the last two years, during which the museum has articulated a contradictory set of goals. One, to dismiss the notion of a homogenous national culture. Two, to place the revised but unspecified notion of American art against a global context. And three, to achieve these two goals through the examination of international influences. There is an illogic to these goals. To go global suggests that one has undone the myth of a single American cultural identity. But if one has not undone that, if the myth remains, then the international arena merely provides a chance to place the myth in a broader context. One ends up trying to define foreign influences for the same old categories, and American influences on other national arts. Nothing undercuts the notion of hybridity cum plurality, which is what the language they were using, as much as an aesthetics of influence, which by its very nature must posit discrete and non-contingent categories in order to postulate that one affects the other. In other words, the exploration of influences reinforces rather than challenges the notion of a homogenous American art, especially insofar as hybridity and heterogeneity are refigured as international phenomenon. While there is ample of under-theorized precedent for the exhibition of non-American art in the Whitney Museum, there is an equal danger in using non-American artists to challenge the notion of a homogenous national culture. One does not have to cross borders to find artistic practices that, whether through outright difference or through their critical engagement of dominant aesthetics, upset, expand, subvert, or undo the category of American art. Furthermore, it is highly questionable that the critique of imagined communities and national purity does not focus on the true beneficiaries of such ideologies, but rather seems by default to blame the racial groups who have constructed identities and maintained cultural practices in the face of such exclusion. To sum up, the museum's press statements elide the logical sequence of events that should follow a commitment to question and revision the category of American art. At the very moment when the Whitney Museum should identify and proclaim racial and sexual minorities as part of a new American patrimony, the curatorial agenda is redirected to the international sphere instead. The old category of American never really goes away, nor do the old assumptions about a nation with distinct qualities, identity, and character. And that's the end of the portion I'll um, quote from. Now, while I've been discussing exhibition, I think there is a direct link to our focus at this conference, which is on scholarship. I've been advisor on a number of American exhibitions, including the Whitney's American Century and LACMA's Made in California. And I include the latter as American because if New York is the art world, then California is surely America. Or at least that's how it looks from Los Angeles, where I live. In any case, I've noticed that these exhibitions often end up looking like a textbook. That is, they illustrate the canonical history produced by the field of American art. At best, those things that are left out of the, his of the history textbooks get added in as a supplement that do not challenge the critical paradigm or historical timelines. Now, what's amazed me is the extent to which Chicano artists have been left out of the very artistic genealogy their work often engages, whether it be the history of representation with uh, Plato's cave becoming Puta's cave, the history of art, with the Mona Lisa refigured as the Virgin of Guadalupe and as a self-portrait of the male artist, Cesar Martinez. <laughs> or the history of modernist art, from Courbet to Matisse to Duchamp. <laughs> or even those works that engage a more explicitly Chicano subject matter and style, but also gesture to the history of art. Ironically, the fact that Chicano artists have, from the start, engaged global issues also goes unnoticed. This is Rupert Garcia, Malakias Montoya. Notice the text. Chicano and other artists and other Latino artists have also participated in international art movements, including destructivism in the 1960s. This is Rafael Montañez Ortiz. Uh, in fact, the Chicano art group OSCO, which did emerge out of the student walkouts and police riots in East LA in the late 1960s, relied on the response of the international press to its male art as an indirect route to the US press that otherwise did not cover Chicano artists and their concerns, but they did cover the international press. In the early 1970s, OSCO would engage in conceptual performance that drew attention to the art world, uh, particularly public institutions. This is the entrance to LACMA or 
it's a conceptual art piece by uh, Willy Heron, Gronk, Harry Gamboa, and Patsy Valdez, and to police violence. Uh, this is a first supper after a major riot at a point in time when Chicanos weren't allowed to walk down Whittier Boulevard. Uh, but also to what they perceived as the limitations of Chicano arts, emphasis on didactic realism and neo-indigenous neo nationalism recuperated from Mexico of the 1920s. Uh, this is walking mural. Uh, the figures got so bored they walked off the wall. Uh, this is instant mural, in which any Chicano can be a mural icon. <laughs> and they took this critique and they, they made a link between this art th and the marketplace, as in this piece called Cruel Prophet. Osco also produced numerous staged photographs appropriating Hollywood celebrity culture, uh, concurrent with Cindy Sherman's film stills. What proves most difficult to historical thinking is the introduction of the meanwhile. That is, those troubling exceptions that were happening concurrent with the canonical history rather than after. Consider the textbooks that in subsequent editions added a chapter on women and later on one on minorities rather than shift the paradigm. Again, returning to this artist, uh, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, he produced recycled films in 1958 the same year in which Bruce Conner is credited with establishing the genre after some earlier forays by Joseph Cornell. In fact, Ortiz would later screen his films alongside Andy Warhol, Jonas Mikas, and others as part of the new American cinema. The trouble is, Ortiz's recycled films jumped outside the modernist framework established by Conner and followed by others. For lack of a better work, word, his works were postmodern, avant la lettre within the American avant-garde film. In 1968, after a decade of international participation and influence, he would be dropped from the avant-garde, and he would henceforth be discussed as a Puerto Rican artist, or, oddly enough, as a Chicano artist. And uh, our, the Center I Direct has actually published a study that documents this absence for about 100 established artists, kind of running their names through the search engines for the field and through the major textbooks uh, that are being used, including those that are marketed as diverse. And, and it's really quite stunning, uh, the absence that you come up with. Needless to say, it is difficult to shift paradigms, as signaled by the latest edition of Jansen's History of Art. Reading the review in the New York Times, I had the impression that Ana Mendieta was being blamed for the removal of Whistler's mother for the sake of diversity. <laughs> Although Mendieta is not in the book. <laughs> But I think we know who the real culprit is. <laughs> In any case, the fundamental issue is the production of scholarship that can function as building blocks for new histories. The global turn can be a turning away, or it can be a challenge to the national project. In that spirit, uh, I have launched a, a new book series on the contributions of Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, and other US Latino artists. Uh, the, we've actually put a stack of brochures outside the uh, auditorium. And to date, the project has commissioned 15 books, and the first one is now in press with a March 2007 release date. We have a na national advisory board made up of leading Latino art curators and scholars, and we have initial foundation support from the Ford, Getty, Morgan Chase, Rockefeller, and Warhol, among others. What makes this project unusual is that it stems from the conviction that individual artists and their coherent bodies of work are the foundation for a truly meaningful and diverse art history. In other words, there are no presumed context, whether ethnic or national. You get a very different set of premises on the ethnic art history side. You get nothing on the national side. We start with the artist and then work out toward the specific multiple context that makes sense for discussing his or her life and artwork. What's more, the project is designed to produce an archive of recovered materials, oral histories, and images that we will make accessible for future scholarship. The book is just the starting point of a dialogue. I would like to end by showing uh, some of the images and related documents for the first book on the artist Gronk, one of the artists also associated with OSCO. The writer, Max Benavides, describes Gronk as such. Gronk has applied his experience as an urban Chicano to combine and repurpose the Western creative tradition with a range of other influences, including Cantinflas, the Mexican film comic, uh, Osu, the filmmaker, Daffy Duck, 
cartoons, among many other cultural touchstones. Anyone wishing to examine Gronk's work critically must take into account his origins in street culture, as well as what Bell Hooks calls the dynamism springing from the convergence, contact, and conflict of varied traditions." End of quote. Consider his uh, black and white mural with Willy Huron in 1973, which alludes to the French uh, film classic Children of Paradise. There you see uh, Baptiste in the lower left-hand corner as an integral part of its critique of police violence in East LA, this film made during the Nazi occupation. While never written about before, Gronk staged one of the first gay performances pieces in East LA in 1969 with Cyclona, shown here, and Mundo Mesas, called Caca Roaches Have No Friends. Uh, it ended with the mostly family audience uh, taking possession of the stage and setting it on fire. In the 1970s, <laughs> he also collaborated in male art pieces with Jerry Driva, performance with Tomata Duplanti, and with Teddy Sandoval, here, in the Frida Kahlo story. <laughs> While mostly known for his, exp uh, by the way, none of this was, has ever been dealt with in uh, Chicano art uh, scholarship, such as there is at this point. While mostly known for his expressive paintings in the 1980s, uh, this last one called Baghdad Cocktail, uh, after the first Gulf War, he has also uh, done a set design with Peter Sellers. Uh, this is a uh, Ina de Mar, uh, which was recently performed um, on the life of Lorca, a Spanish playwright. As Max Benavides notes, Gronk has mixed high and low influences from Osu to Devil Girl from Mars, which one can see come together in his first painting series, Godzilla, produced shortly after the US release of the film. Uh, here's the artist at the time. He's only about five years old. <laughs> But seriously, uh, one, one goal of this series is to gather the artifacts that give the artwork a historical context, uh, such as this uh, image of the score bar, and you can see one of the Gronk paintings hanging in the, in the back. And the challenge are historical timelines. Here is his NEA application in 1981, in which Gronk proposes at the bottom, he gives a really nice history of his, of his work to this point, and at the bottom he proposes erasing the U.S.-Mexico border. And this is some three years before the formation of the Border Arts Workshop. He didn't get the grant, but he did get one in 1984 when the Border Arts Workshop was formed. Um, we have digitized thousands of such documents, including uh, napkin art, uh, journals, and also diaries. While the book serves as a necessary starting point, this archive, which we hope to put online, ensures that when we go looking for the big picture, we have images of the Latino artist at work. Thank you. But can I left click on this? Or? Okay. All right, it's, it's always fun to be the last one on the panel. <laughs> But anyway, um, I, I want to thank Cynthia Mills and the Smithsonian American Art Museum very much for inviting me to be part of the discussion. Um, as earlier mentioned, I am an Americanist scholar, um, originally from Hawaii, um, who specializes in contemporary Asian American art and visual culture. Now, in considering the far-reaching implications of globalization uh, for conceptualizing American art today, I think of the open question posed by Homi Baba uh, during his 1998 dialogue with Shazia Sikander, a Pakistani-born artist and new MacArthur fellow um, who resides in the United States. Uh, wary of his own presuppositions and those of Western audiences in approaching art made in the Asian diaspora, Baba asks, but suppose we don't want an exoticism, we don't want an Orientalism, what kind of intercultural knowledge is necessary? What must I know? What must I be as a citizen spectator? Baba's strategic linking of the rhetorics of citizenship and spectatorship uh, frames my remarks today in suggesting that we bear a larger ethical accountability as viewers and interpreters of contemporary art in finding ways to communicate within and across ever more complex realms of difference. 
As the American art world, like society in general, becomes increasingly transnational, made more pronounced by the heightened presence of foreign-born artists from non-Western societies in the US, uh, fundamental issues of meaning, interpretive authority, and cultural translation are seeming an ever more prominent position. Today's world is awash in migration. New nations continue to be born. Fresh regional and international allegiances are forming. And the struggles of indigenous and minority groups for recognition, self-determination, and survival proceed unabated. Amid ever more intricate cultural crossovers, mixtures, and hybrids that result from such encounters and negotiations, the challenge is to develop lines of inquiry capable of capturing what is happening at many levels in textured and open-ended ways. Such approaches must be able to account for the specificities of artistic standpoints and also simultaneously discerning the intellectual and political preoccupations, the boundary hopping context and the larger historical and cultural conditions that currently inspire, link and frame their efforts. Now as globalization, globalizing processes likewise could reconfigure practices of museum and exhibition display, endeavors are underway to develop comparative transnational analyses of cultural institutions' responses to these changing conditions. Um, there, there are actually three books, Exhibiting Cultures, Museums and Communities, and the forthcoming edited volume, Museum Frictions, Public Cultures, Global Transformations, uh, which builds on the two prior books as important they need to be recognized as important milestones in these efforts. Uh, catalyzed by surging non-Western immigration and cross-cultural exchange, contemporary Asian American art can usefully be seen as a bellwether of these ongoing societal and global transformations. Following the abolition of restrictive federal immigration quotas in 1965, the contours of Asian, Asian America were dramatically reconfigured by the explosive growth of new immigration from Asia and the Asian Pacific. As immigrants came to substantially outnumber the US-born generations, Asian America itself became this vast contact zone where the newly arrived had converged and sometimes collided with one another, with American-born Asians and with the society at large. Amid this growing internationalized circulation, as others have pointed out, migration can no longer be viewed as a one-way street culminating in assimilation, but rather as a much more fluid process. Now, from the vantage point of New York City, a major locus of new migration during the pivotal period of the 70s and 80s, it was clear to many Asian Americans in the arts that the post-65 influx of Asian immigrants was introducing new transnational perspectives and differing priorities into the domestic sphere. Increasingly, these interactions would relativize the issues of domestic identity politics, civil rights struggles, and multiculturalism that had preoccupied my generation of US-born baby boomers and fueled prior cultural activism. Now, by the 90s, the expanding presence of foreign-born Asian artists and intellectuals, including a major wave from mainland China, would also begin to have a significant impact on the American art world and on the Asian American arts communities. This accompanied a groundswell of interest beginning in the 80s among US museums, galleries, curators, and critics in new art emerging from Asia. Works by these artists underscored the cross-cultural slippages, as well as the connections that emerged as Asia and the West dynamically produce, revise, and retransmit images of one another in an, in an elaborate and often ambiguous process of mutual transformation. Um, here I'm going to briefly compare two projects that offer different models of engaging with the intersections of the global and local in Asian American art. One is the 1994 thematic exhibition, Asia America, Identities in Contemporary Asian American Art that I organized for the Asia Society Galleries in New York. And the other is the 2003 volume of intercultural criticism, Fresh Talk, Daring Gazes, Conversations on Asian American Art, in which I served as a co-editor. Um, each investigates emergent connections formed at the interstitial nodes of contact between peoples and cultures that arise from global flows of labor, from trade and consumerism, diasporic settlement and movement, war and forced migration, post-colonial displacements and realignments, sovereignty struggles, and from other conditions that have both compelled and drawn people to circulate around the world. Both projects centrally involve dialogism, 
respectively, as an analytical approach to interpreting works of art, and in the case of Fresh Talk, as a premise to bring Asians and non-Asians from a range of background, backgrounds and interests together in conversation around Asian American art. Um, as I speak, I'm going to show selected work from each project. Um, drawing on an example from Fresh Talk, I'm going to suggest the potential of dialogism as a strategy for new scholarship and critical writing on American art um, in responding to the challenges of dealing with difference in collaborative and exploratory ways. Based on my current research with artists living in Hawaii, I will conclude with an additional example in which the commonality is currently being expressed by native Hawaiian artists with other peoples and cultures of the Pacific and with indigenous movements the world over point to another significant facet of modern globalization. Um, Asia America was the first major exhibition of contemporary Asian American art mounted by the Asia Society. Through the lens of cross-cultural identity formation, Asia America sought to shed light on how larger processes of global movement and interchange play out in the expressive transactions of foreign-born artists who have used their work to negotiate their passages between societies and their complex positionings as Asians living in the West. Featuring 20 artists of East, Southeast, and South Asian descent, the exhibition showcased multiple strategies of self and collective representation that drew on an expanse of cultural <laughs> and historical sources, as well as different media, styles, and artistic precedents. The accompanying essay was based on analyzing the transcripts of extensive audio, audio taped oral interviews I conducted with each artist in jointly interpreting specific works they produced. This dialogic process arose from very pragmatic issues that I faced as an Americanist, doing cross-cultural research with Asian artists from very different backgrounds, in which the underlying meanings and references in their work could not be assumed. Despite their use, as you can see, of uh, the internationalized artistic idioms and visual languages shaped by modernism and postmodernism. Influenced by the unconventional thematic model offered in Lucy Lepard's groundbreaking work, Mixed Blessings, New Art in a Multicultural America, Asia America was organized around four broad themes, each intended to delineate different processes by which artists engaged with a society, with their cultures of origin, and with the sites of passage and settlement. A foundational premise of the exhibition was that identities are fluid, multivalent, and continually being reimagined through the interventions of individual artists. And uh, I always enjoy this last one of Seng Kuang Chi. This is Disneyland, 1979. Um, Fresh Talk Daring Gazes represented an experimental effort to build a larger discursive community around Asian American art by involving a group of multi-ethnic and multinational writers. It was apparent that in the intervening years since the rise of ethnic studies in the 1970s, prior instrumentalist notions of the arts as an adjunct to politics and community empowerment would no longer be sufficient in accounting for the range of contemporary art and ideas being generated today. Um, as the editorial team agreed that no single ideological or disciplinary framework should be imposed on interpreting this art, the open-ended dialogic approach to cultural criticism that now foundationally structures the book was adopted. In our efforts to position the Asian presence in more broadly relational and globalized terms, we decided to make the book primarily a forum for exchange among members of minoritized communities who have had too few opportunities to reflect on one another's cultural production. As such, we mostly solicited contributors of other non-European heritages African and African American, Middle Eastern, Latino, Caribbean, and Native American. I, I knew that you folks would appreciate that last one. <laughs> um, uh, the writers, who included scholars, cultural critics, curators, artists, and activists, were each paired with the work of a different Asian American visual artist. This approach embodied our dual commitment to advance interchange between Asians and other people of color and to put forward alternate perspectives to Eurocentric interpretations of this work. Um, this project is perhaps the first to convene such a prominent and diverse group of British and US-based writers specifically to interpret art by Asian Americans. Um, let me see, I think I've moved forward. 
This is Albert Chong's more recent work. Some of you may recognize. Now, among the book's many memorable essays, Ella Shohat's reflections on the work of Japanese-American artist Lin Yamamoto readily comes to mind. Shohat, an Israeli-born scholar who describes herself as an Arab Jew, comments, I ask myself, why am I willing to participate in this project? And what do a Japanese-Hawaiian-American and an Iraqi-Israeli-American have to do with each other, apart from sharing residency in the United States? Seeking common ground on which imaginative linkages might be formed, uh, Shohat found a personal connection in this 1992 installation, 10 in one hour. Here, Yamamoto alludes to the hard life of her immigrant Japanese grandmother, who worked as a laundress on a sugar plantation in Hawaii. Through the motif of lumps of soap embedded with patches of hair, Shohat perceived resonances with her own grandmother's life as a household servant for Israelis of European heritage following the expulsion of Iraq's ethnic Jewish population after the creation of Israel. As she remarks, we, the granddaughters of diasporic domestic workers, have traveled a long road. Her essay points to cross-cultural global connections between migrant women, arising from shared experiences of menial labor in which Yamamoto's work serves as an evocative point of encounter. Uh, my final example concerns a contemporary indigenous artist from Hawaii uh, Kaili Chun. Um, due to the island's central position as a Pacific crossroads, patterns of settlement and formations of local culture have long been complexly shaped by forces of globalization through the combined interventions of Oceanic, Asian, and Western people alike. Yet, in the only state in this nation with an Asian majority population, competing claims to place and belonging between various Asian immigrant groups and their descendants and indigenous peoples have strongly impacted local cultural politics. Moreover, the ongoing struggle of native Hawaiians to achieve political sovereignty and self-determination in which the arts and culture play an integral role have become part of the transoceanic flows and the interchanges among indigenous peoples that extend throughout the Pacific and the Pacific Rim to engage with Native American artists of North America. Concurrently, uh, there have been high-profile museum exhibitions, uh, like the 2005 Changing Hands, Art Without Reservations II, um, in which Chun took part, that likewise brought Hawaiian and Pacific Islander artists together with their, native, their North American indigenous counterparts. Now, in the work of uh, sculptor Kaili Chun, who is of mixed Native Hawaiian and Chinese ancestry, um, as seen in this 2006 installation, Na Ukavai, The Choice Belongs to You, is informed by conceptualism. Yet, its, its formal and epistemological foundations are firmly embedded in her Hawaiian heritage. Like many artists of her generation, Chun draws strength from the renaissance of Hawaiian culture that began in the 70s, as activists have sought to revive the Hawaiian language and traditional culture in all its forms, arts, crafts, music, and dance. Nauka Vai is conceived as a site of contemplation in which Chung invites the viewer to enter a native space, one that embodies the close spiritual relationship uh, indigenous Hawaiians have to their land, and that points toward an abiding concern with cultural survival amidst the, per the pervasive effects of colonialism. Intermingling symbolic reference to Christianity, which has deeply affected native culture, the installation gestures to the historic shaping of Hawaiian cultural hybridity via both syncretism and the impact of external imposition. Now, flanked by the ceremonial basins uh, filled with water and salt, ele elements essential to sustaining life. And let me see if I can just go back. If I, if I, can I go back, actually, on this? OK, let me just try it. Nope. OK. So I can just do it. Can you now just hit previous? OK. Um, and drawing on local materials like volcanic rock, the artist fashioned pathways from, from slabs of semi-polished stone uh, to encircle the upright boulder, which, according to the artist, forms a spiritual and political jumping off point. Smaller hollowed out rocks arrayed around the, the surrounding gallery walls conceal ghostly photographic images of important figures from Hawaiian history, 
underneath doll-like wooden plugs imprinted with related texts. Now, despite this densely referential conceptual matrix, the piece is intentionally ambiguous and elusive, challenging non-native viewers to actively decipher its layered meanings. As Chun asserted in our recent interview, we welcome you to come look through our viewfinder, our mirror into our world. And sometimes you may need to get down on your knees to look at it. But are you willing to humble yourself to do that? Echoing Baba's question, what must I be as a citizen spectator? Chun's measured statement provides a fitting conclusion to this presentation. Given the potential access that contemporary scholars, curators, and writers have to living artists, such words emphasize that in our encounters with difference in an ever more globalized field, a measure of curiosity and humility, coupled with a willingness to accept discomfort when engaging with makers like Chun would serve us well. Engaging with difference means to be guided by a spirit of act active inquiry in which one is ever alert to superimposing and reproducing existing assumptions, expectations, and hierarchies of value on the expressive production of another people and culture, whether beyond or within the boundaries of this nation. The foregoing examples make it plain the strategic acts of translation and ongoing dialogue are required at many levels in order to better render the diverse worldviews and intentions of such artists as well as the contextual meanings of their work more legible to wider audiences, and hence available and socially useful as part of a larger body of knowledge about the changing times that we I'm going to open the, the floor to um, comments as well as questions. I suspect that from this audience, I expect people have things they want to say and add to the discussion this afternoon. We are going to ask you to go to one of the two mics. There's one on each side of the room, even though one could shout and probably make oneself heard here. Because of webcast needs, we need to have your voice loud and clear. I don't, yeah, not nothing. And oh, yes, and to please identify yourself. That would be um, courteous, nice. Uh, can I just first ask the panelists, is there anyone there that would like to um, uh, expand upon or, or respond to uh, any points made in each other's papers, or do, is there any pressing? I can't say that. Uh, not pressing. Not pressing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let's start with questions and or comments, and then we'll just see how it goes. And I'm sure there'll be uh, things that people want to um, respond to. Anybody? Yes. Jonathan, is yes. that you, Jonathan? Yes, that is me. Thanks, Wanda. Uh, Jonathan Katz here. And I just wanted to, um, to say that I found uh, Wanda's taxonomy of various approaches to globalism very, very helpful. But I was curious, and I actually wanted to kind of direct this question both to Wanda and to the panel at large, um, at the way in which it still seemed to instate a national context in discussion of, of globalism. This was touched on a little bit in the panel, particularly in, in Angela's paper. But I was struck by the fact that there are currently um, transnational circuits uh, in American art that really do not have any kind of national purchase whatsoever. Um, and that there are, it seems to me, particularly even, even today, a kind of disidentification going on in an American context which claims those discourses um, and makes them into American art, but that it's high time that we looked at things like performance and pop um, as truly global phenomena. Um, and I wanted to see, uh, generally, uh, how the panel would respond to that. So were those the two instances you were thinking of? Well, there, I think there are many mm -hmm. more, but my, my point is that um, we have perhaps reached the point where we need to provocatively question um, the Americanness of a number of American cultural styles um, and wonder whether that is, in fact, simply a kind of blindness or ignorance on our part. Yeah. Well. Does anyone want to uh, respond to that? Did, yeah. <clears throat> did you um, say that these developments were taking place in the US? Uh, 
There, no. You said yeah. there, are now, there are now a number of groups in the U.S. that are already going beyond the national paradigm. That's what you said. Right, right. Yeah. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. There with is you. an American transnationalism. <laughs> Well, that sounds interesting. Let's see if we can push that a little bit. I mean, Jonathan, yeah, your point is sense, that there are some American, uh, that, um, I guess I've, I don't even know if I want to call them Americans. Are, are you saying that there's some kinds of art making or some artists who are themselves basing their, uh, their expression on uh, what, no identity, that is, that could be contained or um, defined or narrated? I guess I, what I'm saying is that, for example, let's go back to uh, relatively remote historical, I mean, con in contemporary terms, the, the early 1960s, where we can see um, concurrently developments in Brazil, in Germany, in France, in England, and in the United States, all dealing, for example, with the political um, meanings of uh, the, the idea of Eros. Um, we look at Carolee Schneemann in the United States and we often claim this as a particularly American thing, but we forget that Yayoi Kusama is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, these are ideas that circulated transnationally. Mm -hmm. How is it productive to address them um, from an American context? I see, I see. I, I guess I would say that that certainly shouldn't be the exclusive context from which they should be discussed. Um, I, I, maybe also would pop art and its multiple appearances multinationally be another example? Absolutely. Of, yeah. And we, we uh, I, I used to do this. I used to teach pop art by, you know, showing Richard Hamilton and then all the Americans. Right. Richard. And I never noticed the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. Who said abstract expressionism? Is that one of our panelists? Is that you, Angela? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there, abstract expressionism was an international phenomenon. And, uh, uh, you know, I've talked with a colleague about doing something on uh, international culture in the Cold War, which would would uh, compare, for instance, Germany and the U.S., but the problem is that I don't read German, and, you know, and our, many of our students, I'm embarrassed to admit that in this audience, but I mean, a lot of our students are hampered by, by linguistic barriers. I mean, isn't, don't you think, Jonathan, that that's a, that's a problem with doing this kind of comparative work? Absolutely. Yeah, I also would add one other thing, which is that I, mean, I think that there's a problem in constructing these things. Is that I, know, I wrote down here, globalism does not equal post-national. So in other words, I think in a way it's a privileged position to be able to claim post-nationality at a time when, if anything, many new nationalisms are emerging and not necessarily for negative reasons. Um, I think that's the same kind of problem when you talk about identity and post-identity politics. Uh, setting up and maintaining certain kinds of binarisms that, that I think are very problematic to set up. Um, and also I'd be afraid that we would then fall back into kind of this unmoored cosmopolitanism, which, which I think is, is, again, intellectually really problematic. Yeah, I think that could be the other extreme of this. I, I agree, it's quite fascinating to look at what's happening concurrently in a global context and to acknowledge the fact that the artists are often part of that, uh, making the connections in terms of traveling. Um, and I think sometimes that's the best place to begin rather than uh, genre or, or national identity or gender or ethnicity or sexuality, uh, but to really begin to put the history together of exactly how are there or are there not connections. Where, where might we have an instance of just simultaneity uh, where you see something emerge in one historical context for one set of reason and you see it emerge elsewhere um, uh, for others. I, you know, in, in terms of picking up on, on broadly on that issue, I guess I would take exception to the notion of uh, racial or gender minorities as fitting under a rubric of identity politics, because I think that imposes some of the same phenomenon that, that you're pointing out. Well, what happens when you impose American as the first category? You immediately excuse yourself from having to make connections. What happens when you impose identity politics? 
you immediately absolve yourself of acknowledging that in fact, for the most part, it's American art that's caught up in identity politics. Um, a lot of what's considered minority art is just responding to that or trying to <laughs> find a way around. And, and I think it limits the work and why it's important in, in many instances just to go back to the artist and the artwork and start from, start from there. I, I do think there's a, a limit point and, and Wanda uh, framed this in terms of expanding the canon. And I, it brings me back to the Janssen's uh, issue in terms of the, reissue, the, the new edition of the book. At some point, you, you, you have added the last signature to the book. So there is a limit, you know, you can maybe have 800 pages, but you're not gonna have 900 pages. So the canon is not endlessly expanding. I mean, you can only teach so much art within a 10 or 14 week term. You, you do make selections. You do say this is more important than that. And I don't think we can let go of that as a responsibility and as something that has consequences uh, in terms of how does one go about taking into account uh, a greater degree of diversity within a category, whether it's a genre or whether it's a nation or what have you, uh, let alone trying to understand things in a global context. And I think in the first instance is the, that it will not be endlessly expanding. Uh, there will be at some point where you have to articulate your reasons for making selections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I'll just quickly respond to that to say that I think, um, uh, I don't know if it will, ever end, <laughs> well, I, I, because I think what, what I, I like about expanding the canon is that it actually gives you choices. Mm -hmm. I think in the old days we didn't have choices because our books all told us the same things about mm -hmm. the same artists and so we were forced into, um, not forced into, but we didn't know better in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And once we did know better, we needed a lot more information, we needed more pictures and slides and images and we needed biographies and we needed uh, interconnective tissue to begin to um, move outside some of the narratives we'd been handed as, as young art historians. So in that way, mm -hmm. uh, that's the way I, I meant expanding the canon. It doesn't mean you have to teach everything in the canon. Obviously you can't, but you can, <laughs> we each have our own canons, I think, uh, within a course or within a lecture, um, and we are making choices. But at least we can have those choices to make, and I'm for having more of them rather than less of them. So I. I applaud the continued expansion. Um, uh, we'll see, but Winfred, did you have also a response you wanted yeah, to make to that? And then I'll take yeah, the next two question. Two things. Um, one, uh, of course, who could be against expansion? But uh, <laughs> then the question always is that, um, what is this expanded object standing for? Because expansion in itself can't possibly be the goal. And we have had presentations here today in which we had clearly a context for that what was presented in an extended context, namely, for example, Asian American. So, so you need a narrative, and I think expansion in itself is sure. not a value. Um, coming back to the question of Americanness, I think it might help to to uh, consider that we are always sometimes conflating two possible meanings or so two possible uses of the term American in these discussions. One is the, um, the, the sort of national identity meaning of American, that when you say, what well, there are artists now who are no longer drawing on a national tradition but are widely transna uh, uh, transnational, international, and so on, the implication of the meaning of the term American used in that argument is there is ironically still exceptionalist, namely the assumption that there is or was something like a national style, and that has now been successfully transcended. So there you still have that exceptionalist meaning. Somebody like Tocqueville, who actually introduced the term exceptional, but in a completely different context, wouldn't use it in that way. He would say, exceptional for me means that in America there are different conditions for the development of culture. And no matter whether there are artists who are radically transnational and have nothing to do with the old national style ideology of American exceptionalism, nevertheless can be American in that sense because their art develops in an American context. There was this wonderful slide, the one slide I've forgotten, where you had something like the, uh, this is, I take this from memory, it's completely wrong, I guess, 
the Elizabeth Bowen Chair Award, prize award. There was a presentation of an art object that was underneath the heading of, a, of an award, and the award had a particular, the name of patron, or, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, Charlie Chung. Yeah. That's so American. <laughs> <laughs> Said from a cross-cultural perspective. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Jonathan Feinberg. I, I, um, I think I want to really start with something that John said earlier about um, his series of, uh, of books that he's embarking from uh, looking at what an artist does um, in, as an individual and then broadening from there into categories because and I think that's uh, I mean I'm of course publicly on record for people I've been accused of writing heroic narratives which I've done deliberately on exactly that premise because uh, I think that it's impossible for us to erase where we were raised or the cultural conditions that we encountered uh, in our in our develop our intellectual development and human development I mean if we are raised in America we are in some respects uh, significant re respects shaped by that, and I do think that there are commonalities. Um, so, but it's a very complex situation, and I think that I would uh, tend to look at this rather as, um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I would argue for an exceptionalism that is by individuality rather than by by nationhood. But it is certainly how you can't avoid it being inflected by by your nationality and by what you encounter, and so there are. Commonality. So when you look at something like uh, like the pop art phenomena, I think um, you know Jonathan's quite right. It's obviously there are international things, and it's quite complex in the way in which these things interact. And it's wrong to try if we make if we put pigeonholes around everything, we lose a lot. Um, but you know, but there are certain things that uh, that that societies and and groups of people do have in common in a given place and a given interaction, which does shape the character of what they do. And I think that there. Are, is a certain look to New York pop that's different than California pop, and there's a, you know, and within California pop, there's a lot of var varieties, and it's shaped by all these different kinds of, uh, of things. So, uh, you know, I think we have to take a kind of a more individualistic ap approach, and I think because of that, ultimately, what we're talking about as the canon is, in fact, constantly under revision, and that's what makes it so interesting. Is that you know, the, the way, if we go, I want to go back to first principles and say, you know, what, why is an artist taking the trouble to do what they do, and they're doing it because they're trying to make sense out of their experience. And they're literally giving form to what they experience in the world before they can talk about it in another way. And that's what makes this um, you know, a kind of dialogue that is constantly uh, changing. Artists are constantly rewriting the history of art by going back and we find out what they're interested in, and it changes the history. So, whatever that's worth. <laughs> well, I think one thing that you do raise, Jonathan, is a point that uh, I think Winfred was also, uh, in a certain way, describing when he used the Tocquevillian um, analogy, which is that uh, I get a little nervous about American because it's so all-encompassing. I, I felt good when you just spoke about New York pop versus LA pop versus London pop versus um, French pop. I mean, I, I feel a little bit better if we narrow the terms to... Uh, exactly what the what was your Tocquevillian experience? The, the various conditions under which an artist is trying to make sense of the word, and um, uh, it seems to me we do better sometimes if we are careful to delineate our region or our our um, community in which these expressions are, are coming out of, uh, without trying to make broader claims for some kind of national personality or national um, character. I'd like to put a a little John. bit of a, a spin on that in terms of um, what that looks like from the perspective of trying to uh, write about Chicano or even more broadly Latino uh, art. Before actually launching this book series about a year ago, I did about two years worth of research to just determine what's, what's really out there. And what we found was that by and large what had been written about individual artists had been done in small exhibition catalogs or program program uh, publications, and that what had been written more broadly than that tended to be the survey. Everybody had written the survey article that was giving you the grand narrative of Chicano art, starting at some point either uh, with the Aztecs or with 1848, <laughs> if you're more of a contemporary uh, <laughs> person. 
but giving you some sort of historical context. Oftentimes, in going back to the Aztecs, you realize what, what people are doing is trying to remove a certain national framework as being predominant. They're giving themselves a kind of history rooted in you know, preceding the nation, preceding history. Uh, but that's what there was, there, and there were no extended studies of individual artists, and there were really no in-depth studies of, of particular uh, tendencies, styles, issues, what have you. And so what, what I thought the best thing that we could do is actually start with individual artists. Uh, we focused on artists that um, initially are in the 60s and 70s, and to look at their work in some depth, and to not put any of those expectations on it, to really just build out and you may come to some of the same places that other people have started. That, that yes, Mexican culture was very important or this political movement was important. But to let, let that person's life and their artwork take us there. But having said that, what I thought we'd have is two outcomes. One is, by working in the, the monograph as a kind of basic building block of art history, you are providing uh, some of the reference tools that the textbooks or the surveys use that are largely mining secondary literature. So there it is. Uh, it hasn't been there before, and if you take it up, that's to be expected. If you don't, there's really no excuse now, because the building blocks are, are there. So from one perspective, I thought this, this would allow this work of these artists, who I think, I think their work is great, I think it, it touches on so many things other than the category they're contained within. Uh, uh, for example, someone like Rupert Garcia or Malachias Montoya to be excluded continually from exhibitions or histories about graphic arts. Well, that's ridiculous. They've been doing this for 40 years at a pretty exceptional level. So that was the one side. But the other side, I do believe, you know, as fictional as they are, they're still functional, which are these categories like American art and Chicano art, that we'd also be able to tell a more complex and complicated version of Chicano art history. Uh, as something that does emerge out of a social protest movement, does take a certain shape, but is much more complicated uh, than the story the practitioners have told. Um, they're, they're, they're telling one that serves the immediate needs, but isn't necessarily historically accurate. And what is historically accurate is much more interesting in terms of the complexities, and in particular, uh, the ways in which this as a movement was interwoven with the, the gay rights movement, with the women's movement, uh, uh, black civil rights movement, international movements in terms of human rights. And that's fascinating because there you actually begin to show where these individuals through their own particular works and actions are really in some ways connected uh, to global phenomenon. And so in, in a way I thought we're, we're really in some ways taking a very conservative approach, but it's really the only way to kind of build out to those more complex histories. What's conservative about it? Um, I guess I'm saying that from the perspective of, she asked what's conservative about it, I, from the perspective of, um, of uh, Chicano studies, mm -hmm. which is really downplaying the notion of individualism and putting a focus on community and, 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 and culture. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just one brief comment on what you said, of course, who could be against differentiation. But uh, when you try to put the region in the place of the na nation, you're doing, theoretically speaking, exactly the same mm -hmm. type of generalization as the other scholars did before. When you say that you want to focus on something like LA art, then you're assuming there's something like a common denominator mm -hmm. called LA art, but there isn't. LA is so incredibly heterogeneous, mm. the logical end of your argument is that they're only individuals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if there are circuits of conversation and responses among those individuals, then don't you have some claim for a communal identity? That's my argument. Yeah. Yeah, it, it could be. <laughs> I don't think that's what we heard, though. That could be. That could be. I've heard this before. Jonathan, do you want to respond? Yeah, Not you, Jonathan. Be, yeah, the other Jonathan. Misleading. I, I think Jonathan's right more, more about this, except that it can be very misleading. I'm going to just tell you something that happened to me recently. I was having a conversation with Mariko Mori, who lives in New York and has worked in New York for, for many years. And I said to her, um, you know, who do you hang out with in New York? And we were, we were just, I was just having a conversation about, you know, because I, I really I never see her at things. You know, the only time I ever see her is if I go there and we talk. 
So um, she said, I don't know any artists in New York. She's been living there for years. She said, I don't know any artists in New York. And I said, really, well, you know, um, what, where do you see yourself, to, to, to your point, you know, where do you see yourself um, located in terms of what you do? I mean, what is the context in what you do? And she said, well, really, I see myself in an airplane. And she said, I thought it really struck me because she said to me, you know, if I were, if I stayed in Japan to work, I wouldn't be able to work because the power of Japanese culture um, is so resonant with my upbringing that it would, that I'd feel, I'd feel hemmed in by that. And to be in New York is wonderful because I don't have to have any relationship to anybody or anything. And, and she said, the artists that I really talk to the most are the ones that I meet at the international exhibitions when I travel around. So I mean, it's, I think, you know, it's, uh, it, it, that was fascinating to me. Um, and I think it does speak to some of these uh, points. You know, we are, uh, we, we, we could be being extremely, uh, re uh, we're always in danger of being reductionist when we start to create a lineage historically. We look at, you know, uh, you know le le uh, Latin American art that goes back 100 years when we don't really know whether the artists today, if whether that's the context that they really are um, uh, self-identifying with and in what ways they're identifying with and how they's, they've interpreted. So it really is back to, Yes, I think we are, um, to, to Winfred's uh, point, we are always constructing narratives. Um, and that's what we do as human beings, we're always mm -hmm. doing that. We're inventing history for ourselves. Every artist invents their own art history, in effect. But, um, but I think that uh, we have to be very careful to look at the individuality of each case to really mm -hmm. determine which histories are relevant and how they've been shaped. Yeah. But to the other point, which is the other Jonathan's point, Katz's point, I think is that there is community someplace. Yes. And for that woman, it may be the person sitting next to her on an airplane. I don't That's know. Right. She sounds truly transnational in her efforts in any case. But and, uh, similarly, I think, I feel very strongly that we do define what that community or that discourse is that people are working uh, But the within. individuals are defined, well, I think Jonathan's point too is, you know, the individuals are, uh, are, are defining the, that the world of discourse and it may not be what we expect it to be. Well, that's, that's why Chan's point is particularly important is that to go back to, the, to actually, and as I was saying about orality, is to try to really understand how the artist does position themselves as part, and then what you bring as a scholar is then to contextualize that in different ways. Um, like for example, I could have said about Kylie Chun that she also studied architecture at Princeton, which she did. Uh, so she studied architecture at Princeton. She apprenticed for eight years with a master wood carver in Hawaii. Um, and her apprenticeship consisted of things like um, taking him to the doctor, buying him lunch, um, you know, cleaning his house if necessary, and he teaches her about traditional Hawaiian woodcraft. And then she also is very cognizant of, of conceptual art, you know, and very sophisticated. So now, as if you trace this, I mean, it's true that as you were saying, that it opens out into these multiple connections, and that is one way of trying to, to, to be careful about not boxing people into any single frame of reference. You know, but then we only had 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what's obviously very, very important for those of you working with uh, artists who are here to talk to and look at their papers and so on is that you get all that down. And the stories about who their community is or who they're connecting with uh, is, in fact, you're the people uh, that will get that going for the next generation.